Good afternoon and welcome to the second webinar being hosted by operas during 2017. Our focus for the webinar this afternoon is on how ecosystem services can or should be included in policies. Now we have uh, two speakers from the operas team here with us today. Uh, Mariana Ketunen from the Institute of European Environment Policy in London, but she's actually based in Plymouth. And Ilse Kessendorfer from the Tour de Ballet Research Institute for the Conservation of Mediterranean Wetlands in Southern France. And both uh, Mariana and Ilse will be presenting for us in a minute. Now, during their presentations, if you have a question or an issue or even a statement that you would like to contribute, then please do so by clicking on the right hand side of your screen. You will see there's a little box saying questions. And if you type a question in there, it gets sent to my colleague Kathleen and all the questions you ask will be posted on the Opla website and you will receive an answer. However, we will also be selecting a couple of questions that come in to deal with immediately in the webinar. If we try to deal with all the questions, we would run out of time, unfortunately. So Kathleen will be selecting a couple of the questions you ask, and I will then pose those directly to our speakers so you get an immediate reply. Um, but if your question is not selected, it will go onto the Opla website. And I've been talking to Mariana and Ilse before we started, and they're both committed to going onto the Opla website and answering all of those questions. So please don't hesitate to submit any questions or comments or issues that you have. And once again, the way you do that is by going to the right hand side of your screen. You will see in the drop down menu a little box called Questions. If you type your question in there, It'll get sent through and we will endeavor to answer it. So it's now time to get going with our main presentations and it's my great pleasure to invite uh, Mariana. I think you're going to start. So the presentation mode goes over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you Martin uh, for the kind introductions and good afternoon everybody. Um, can you see my screen? That's the first important question moderators. I yes, we're all, we're all fine, but it's not Perfect. on display thing yet. Yeah. Yes, just moving on to that one now. There we go. So, good afternoon. Um, I will kick off this uh, Opera's webinar today by talking about how high-level policy initiatives um, can be used to integrate um, ecosystem services and implement ecosystem services and natural capital. Um, and in the context of this uh, particular presentation, I'm focusing on the green economy. Um, wanting to show how vice versa um, while high-level policy initiatives like green economy can be used to implement ecosystem services concept into policies, um, I would also like to argue that uh, ecosystem services and natural capital are actually required to make these high-level policies truly sustainable and make them more concrete and implementable. Um, and within this framework um, and this presentation, um, I'll also try to show you briefly uh, what is the current level of integration of ecosystem services across a number of sectors policies at the EU level and also in the context of Scotland as one of our national um, examples. So green economy is one of the current um, sustainability paradigms that um, one could say is, is trending in a policy world um, and green economy um, is uh, can you guys still see me? I was getting a um, message, an error message. Sorry, can I just check that before I continue? Martin, can you still yeah. hear me? Yes, you're absolutely fine. Please continue and we can see all the slides. Thank you. Okay, that's brilliant because I've got an error message. I wanted to make sure that was correct. Thank you so much. So, green economy, um, it's considered to be an economy that um, it's 
improving human well-being and social equity while it also significantly reduces environmental risks and also importantly reduces ecological scarcities. Um, low carbon, resource efficient and socially inclusive and importantly green economy is considered to take into consideration the protection and restoration of natural capital as a key component of it. And building on that last point particularly, the starting point for this presentation and our work in the context of operas has been that the integration of ecosystem services and natural capital into socio-economic sectors can provide a concrete shift towards a truly green, truly sustainable economy. Um, so that's our starting point. And this integration of ecosystem services into socioeconomic sectors needs to start with the integration of ecosystem services into the policies that govern these different sectors, across different policies. Um, and this happens via three different stages and three different steps. So firstly, we need to look at what is the current level of integration of ecosystem services and natural capital in the different sectoral policies governing our, our socioeconomic sectors. Then we need to identify what are the key areas for further integration, what needs to happen, what can happen in the future. And building on that understanding, one would need to then develop what we call these concrete development paths towards greening a policy sector, particularly focusing on those key policy sectors that are identified important. And this can happen on a local level, it can happen on a regional level or national level and indeed, you know, even um, supranational, so EU level as well. So that is what we're going to be talking about today in my presentation. And that is what we have worked on in the context of operas, developing a guidance to make green economy happen um, and to make integration of existing services and natural capital happen into sectoral policies. So um, what I'm be talking about next builds on the guidance that we have developed and will be available very soon in the uh, OPLA context and OPLA website. But first and foremost, one needs to understand that the policy integration requires to build on a range of different kinds of tools. So first and foremost, you need information. You need what we call information instruments. You need data, you need indicators, you need instruments for monitoring, mapping, accounting systems, and also a range of different types of science policy assessments are developed to bring in information into policy and decision making to different sectors. And with that, ecosystem services um, information. Um, then, of course, you need to bring that information into the decision-making process. And for that, there is a requirement for different kinds of decision support instruments, as we call them. So there are instruments for planning and targeting, instruments for reporting, uh, and particularly impact assessment procedures and different kinds of risk assessments and analysis are the kinds of instruments that can help to bring ecosystem service and natural capital information into the decision-making um, 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 process. And finally, uh, information and bringing that information into decision by, by certain instruments is only fine if you will be then having some concrete instruments to implement the uh, understanding that you have on ecosystem services across sectors. And for that, you need what we call the implementation instruments. So we need dedicated legislative acts and regulations and standards. Uh, we can also have spatially specific instruments, like for example, project areas are spatially specific instruments that can help to implement ecosystem services knowledge, um, different land use zoning instruments as well. Investment is always needed and that investment can be public or it can be private. And when it comes to the private realm, there are different kinds of market-based instruments uh, or certification schemes and, and instruments like that that can be used um, to, um, to uh, help policy integration of ecosystem services. So policy integration requires and starts with a range of tools that we have worked on in the context of operas over these years. Um, and of course, these policies, uh, sorry, these different policy tools and instruments, they really don't work in a silo. They need to work together, ideally. So you take any given policy area, take for example agriculture, and in the context of agriculture, if you think about certification schemes that take um, ecosystem-based approaches into account uh, in the production, those certification schemes are very likely to require investment, usually to begin with public investment to be able to work. Um, public investment and the schemes themselves require different types of planning and targeting instruments They require reporting and of course you have to look at what kind of impacts they have been delivering so you need impact assessment so that basically comes brings you the real more policy and decision support tools 
And finally, as said, you need those information instruments to underpin everything. So you need indicators, monitoring and mapping uh, and assessments to look at both whether your funding has actually worked and gone to where you'd wanted to go and whether your certification schemes have actually delivered for um, sustainable land management. So indeed, different policy areas require different instruments and in an ideal world, these instruments would really work together to support your integration in an effective manner. And that would be therefore looked at over in the context of governance and decision making processes that would look at and synchronize these instruments together. But further on that a bit later. Um, in the context of operas, we've um, concluded that there are three different levels of policy integration that can happen. And the first level is at the level of conceptual integration. So whether the documents that underpin your sectoral policies the sectoral policies that underpin your sectoral operations, um, whether they explicitly or implicitly take ecosystem services and natural capital into account. If so, there is conceptual integration into policies. Um, further to that, um, operational integration has been identified as a more concrete level of integrating um, ecosystem services into policies. So whether on a conceptual level, documents include the mention of ecosystem services, that is fine. But are there actually specific measures or instruments in place within a policy sector like agriculture, forestry or air protection that would actually identify and commit, committedly address ecosystem services as objectives within the policy sectors? So that is another level of integration. And finally, importantly, um, if your conceptual level is right, if there are instruments, but are those instruments actually implemented and the commitments, are they implemented? So does the integration happen on ground in terms of actual policy and decision-making situations? Um, and of course, understandably, the concept of implementation and integration of ecosystem services becomes more and more meaningful when you go down from conceptual integration towards operational having instruments and actual implementation integration. So checking whether something happens actually on the ground. Um, we try to develop um, a guidance system or sort of you know assessment like a simple traffic light system to actually look at the current level of integration um, as your starting point for um, assessing the um, integration potential for ecosystem service into policies and in that context we've identified simple four levels of depth in terms of integration into current um, policies uh, across the conceptual, operational and implementation realm. So firstly, of course, you know, in an ideal world, our policies, sectoral policies would have a comprehensive and explicit integration of ecosystem services into them. And that would mean that on a conceptual level, ecosystem services, all of them would be recognized as in the context of policies. Um, it would mean that there would be tools, concrete policy tools to, to implement them and there would also be a due process to support the implementation and also monitor the implementation. So that would be in an ideal world comprehensive and explicit integration of ecosystem services into sector policies. But of course you know it might be that the integration is not so ex uh, ex um, comprehensive so even though we have ecosystem services mentioned explicitly uh, across the policy sectors but perhaps you know it doesn't include all our ecosystem services. For example, we only look at the water-related ecosystem services, but we don't look at pollination, for example. So then you can say, right, within this context of this, this particular ecosystem um, and sectoral, uh, uh, the integration explicit, but not, not comprehensive. Um, the integration can be also implicit, we considered, uh, and what that usually means is that your ecosystem services have been mainly considered via the possible negative impacts of a sector to nature and ecosystem services. So by that means you have indeed the policy does recognize that nature provides benefits and those benefits would need to be protected but it doesn't really build on or actively do anything about the ecosystem services as such. And of course finally there might be no integration of ecosystem services into sectors at all so there's no recognition of ecosystem services and natural capital in the sector nor any tools to, um, to uh, address that. And I've promised a um, few examples um, in the context of operas that we've, we've uh, done to look at these different level of existing integration. So here's one from the European Union level. So we looked at different relevant policies, sectoral policies at the EU level. We looked at how well they conceptually integrate the ecosystem service and natural capital concept. So is it 
in the policy documents that underpin the sector policies is ecosystem services acknowledged and mentioned. And also we looked at the different uh, operational instruments that are in place to actually implement um, the concept of ecosystem services. And this is what the situation looks like. So looking at dark green is better towards red, you know, it, it becomes less, less good. Um, and what you see is that on a level of concept, ecosystem services and natural capital have been relatively well recognized across a number of EU policy realms. So conceptual level ecosystem services are there. But when it comes to more of the operational side of things, it appears that ecosystem services um, don't really have the tools to, uh, to, uh, to be implemented at the EU level as of yet. Then moving on to looking at the situation in a national level, so going to Scotland, where we did some work in the context of uh, operas, you can see that similar Similar, um, similar table, so different ecosystem services uh, looked at across the policy realms. And what you see that the, um, that, um, the situation is slightly greener than in the EU context. And also what you see interestingly is that when you compare the EU level policy setting with the Scottish one, um, in the operational setting there actually seems to be more happening on the national level in Scotland that there is in EU level. And of course this makes sense because you know the EU is a devolved um, um, system where uh, implementation of, of things becomes more concrete on a national level. But all in all, you know, if this is the situation, at least there seems to be some you know, positiveness there that um, you know there is a um, implementation taking place towards you know EU from EU towards the national level, even though there's plenty of red and improvement still to be uh, still to be had. And of course, you know, we only looked at here conceptual and operational integration, not the actual implementation, because we didn't really have the uh, time and resources to look at that yet. So that's where, of course, things would happen more in place. So that aside. Um, next thing, of course, as I said, would then be to look at how do we take steps forward. So now that we understand the current situation, what will be then the future next steps to be taken? So, and that starts by identifying key opportunities and needs for, for further integration. And in that context, one would need to consider uh, a number of, um, number of aspects and one aspect to consider would be identifying different kinds of win-wins within, within sectoral policies. So within sectors, um, what kind of win-wins can ecosystem service integration provide and also what kind of win-wins can we create between sectors. And to be slightly more concrete about it, for example, if we would take health sector as our sector we will be looking at more explicitly. Um, in terms of the within sector uh, win-wins, um, using for example green areas and protected area networks uh, would be helping to support public, public health um, based on a lot of the information that we have nowadays um, on how green areas support um, public health and mental health. But of course, you know, ideally it will also be helping to deliver um, the uh, conservation objective as well. And then in terms of between sector benefits, if you have green areas for public health, supporting the public health sector, um, those green areas, particularly in an urban setting, can be really important also for air quality improvements. So therefore you have between sector benefits as well um, that will then help to integrate um, ecosystem services into these different two sectoral policies as well. Trade-offs is also a really important consideration when thinking about um, ways forward. So are there in some policy areas trade-offs between um, addressing ecosystem services and also therefore threatening the uh, existence of ecosystem services? Again in the same urban setting, uh, transport sector might be of course you know um, looking to expand and therefore threatening the green areas existence um, and we would might be standing in a you know, crossroads being a trade-offs uh, between the uh, transport sector and the health sector in terms of the green area uh, development. And finally, one has to also think about the policies as are there any development uh, bottlenecks within the uh, policy sector, like for example financial um, um, constraints, and are there windows of opportunity, so are there any upcoming reforms um, that we can use in the future to improve the integration level in the policy sector. And building on that, uh, a number of key criteria can be considered when identifying future action across the policy field. So level of impact, both in terms of conservation goals and also delivering um, 
benefits to the green uh, sector. Urgency, are there some trade-offs that are causing considerable negative impact within the sector that we need to be really addressing? Uh, feasibility, um, different kinds of opportunities, engagement, uh, which sectoral stakeholders might have the most and the best capacity to support the chains? So if there is a clear sector with good set of stakeholders, with good set of knowledge, um, then that could be a sector to be looked at explicitly in a, in a future integration. Um, so based on these different kinds of considerations um, and um, lenses to look at the key opportunities for further integration, um, the third step, as I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, would be then to look at, right, what can we do more concretely and where we would need to go. And in the context of operas, what we've done, we've tried to develop some concrete means to do that via visual means, which I've, I'm going to show you then next as the final thing for the presentation. So, firstly, we would suggest that um, if you and when you've identified where to go next and which sectors to focus on, there is a need to map what we call the integration pathway for these sectors. And it starts by understanding the current situation. So as looked at, you know, what is the current situation in terms of sectoral integration, uh, for example, to the health sector or to the forest sector, agriculture sector. And then you would identify what is actually your future potential. So if you'd integrate ecosystem services into a particular policy sector, be it health or be it forestry or agriculture, what kind of different benefits would that bring to the sector? And you now need to look at the sector in, indeed through the lenses of delivering for kind of economic and broader social well-being because it's in the context of the green economy. So you'll be looking at the benefits towards jobs and skills, public health, regional development, urban development and so forth. So what is the future potential and what does it hold for greening of the sector? You have to look at the different kinds of barriers to change. And of course, you have to look at also the different kinds of drivers to change. And when considering these all together, you'll have an idea for where you are, where you want to go, and what might be hindering you to go there. And you'll be able to then start to address it. So that is what we call the integration pathway for greening a sector. Um, and then when you've identified that, you go back to the set of tools that I showed you in the very beginning. So what kind of instruments and tools to integrate ecosystem services you would have. Um, and then what would happen is that you would look at the policy cycle, which is different for different sector policies, and start mapping the different instruments along the different policy cycle that you have. So looking at where in the policy cycle you need to provide information in terms of uh, data, where you need to be having instruments that will actually look at the um, um, implementation of things and where we will then be doing something and need instruments for evaluation. So you basically look at the policy cycle and finally you actually look at the policy cycle over the time so you will be developing yourself a timeline for the shift towards the greener sector. So very 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 briefly and a bit of a you know, whirlwind tour across policy integration of what needs to be done in the context of green economy but hopefully that gave you some ideas and back to my conclusions and the take-home messages again. So just to say, integration of ecosystem services, natural capital in social sectors can provide a concrete shift towards a green economy in a way that will function within ecosystem limits, will build on nature's capital and will actually deliver sustainability objectives. So I leave you with that and I hand over back to Martin. Ariana, thank you very, very much. Now, uh, we have a couple of questions here that we'd like to pick up, um, and one is from Alistair Scott, and Alistair, I will be coming to you in a minute um, so that you can ask your question about integration and the 12 principles of the ecosystems of services approach. But uh, before that, we're just going to go to a question from Bruce Howard, who says, can you differentiate between inclusion in public policy and other forms of policy, such as private decision making, which is potentially far more impactful. Mariana, your thoughts on that? Um, yes, um, it's a really good question, and I, I would say, in a way, yes, you can differentiate, um, but maybe you know, rather than using the word differentiate, I would say you would need to be combining the two. So, uh, when looking at your instruments for um, integrating 
ecosystem services into sector of policies, as I showed you. Um, there's, there are, some of them are public, and then there's whole idea of these new, uh, novel, more novel instruments, which would be more in a private sector sector realm. Um, indeed, private sector decision making can be quicker and can having can have therefore more quicker and faster impact. But it might be that it will be more localized. Um, and therefore, in order to mainstream and in order to snowball, um, you know, the impacts, um, you would, I would often argue, require some public uh, policy support as well. So you would require perhaps startup funding, which is public funding. You would require the policy framework to be supportive of these private decision making uh, instances and private initiatives. So do you basically, um, in a way, can differentiate and should also maybe, but you know, you'd be differentiating um, in a way that you want to be making, contributing towards the same goal um, in an as synchronized manner as possible from both of the realms. I guess that's my uh, my comment. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn to our organizers. Sarah, is it possible to bring uh, Alistair online? Alistair, can you hear me? Y yes, I can hear you if you can hear me. We can. Alistair, please, um, we're very intrigued by, by your question there um, on the integration. Could you uh, put that question forward in your own words? Yeah, because my typos from typing actually are pretty bad as well. Well, thank, thank you for the opportunity. All it was, was as you were talking about the integration, integration aspect, I was concerned a little bit that this idea that by incorporating ecosystem services, you can achieve this integration. You did say within your talk that there are all these, there are sort of cherry picking issues of which ones you favour. But what did surprise me um, was that there hasn't been any mention really of the sort of 12 principles of the ecosystem approach. And having done a tools project for the um, UK National Ecosystem Assessment follow on, we were very keen to use integration and to develop frameworks using those principles and it seems to me that in a lot of ecosystem work that those principles have either become implicit or conveniently ignored. I was just wondering how, if at all, that those principles might have impacted into your thinking. Yeah, a really good question and you know, really good point. I would certainly say certainly not, not, certainly not ignored. Um, so I think it's more of a question of, you know, they are in you know, implicit in the thinking, and I guess you know also because you know, the policy world in in a um, in a good and bad, it, it, you know, it moves forward and sometimes moves moves forward you know fast enough, and therefore um, the current um, green economy thinking um, and ecosystem service thinking uh, doesn't explicitly enough, I suppose, you know, go back to the twelve principles of ecosystem ecosystem based approach, either ecosystem approach, even though you know one would argue that it should. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that uh, because you know building on that knowledge from the past, you know, it's kind of implicitly there. But um, but reminded by your question, what I'll actually do is I will make sure um, when we still finalise the product that we actually, you know, the implicity is is good and comprehensive enough um, to have them there. So thanks for the question and pointing it out. Yeah, I'll okay. just say that there are certain principles that are missed, uh, that we found were missed in the policy integration yeah. aspect, and that's important to flag which ones are the missing and the weaker ones that need more focus. Great. Thank you both very much. Now, we have one final question before we move on from uh, Dara Carroll. I'm just going to read the question, and then Dara, we're going to open your microphone as well, if you would like to supplement that with anything. So uh, Dara was asking, what are the distinctive roles for national and local government policy? And which, in your opinion, has more impact? Dara, are you, are you with us? Can you hear me? Uh, Dara, here, yes. Please, did we understand your question correctly? Or, or that's, that's, that's exactly it, yes. It's, it, I suppose it's the different levels of, of uh, of governance, so I, I'm, I'm interested in national policy and, uh, and sort of more local ground-based level. Very good, thank you. Mariana, how do you see these differentiations between the, the national and local government policies and where do you think the greatest impact can be achieved? Um, I think, you know, of course, by definition, the, you know, there's a great impact. Impact happens on a local level. That's where the land is managed and the ecosystem services are managed and conserved. So that's, that's I think, you know, 
that's given. But particularly in this context of national versus local, um, I would very simply say that um, I would say the key role for the national level policy, there would be to facilitate, uh, facilitate via investment and facilitate by policies that, that are, are supportive and certainly don't you know, pull the rug up from under from good initiatives um, that are sustainable um, and use existing services and nature-based solutions on that. Um, and therefore, the local government and policy would be the, the um, phase where the implementation would happen. Um, and therefore, that's, um, that's where there should be concrete tools to, um, and knowledge as well to, um, to allow effective implementation. So national level, I would say facilitate local government policy implement and then of course you know have the system in place to make sure that these two actually work together in an effective manner. Sounds wonderful if we could achieve that. <laughs> um, Mariana thank you very much and thank you also for the questions um, but of course we're only halfway through and it's now my great pleasure to hand over to Ilsa who is going to elaborate further on this issue and please for anybody listening do remember if you would like to ask a question just simply type it into the question box if we get a chance to deal with it now in the webinar we will do um, but otherwise you will find answers to all of your questions on the Oplo website. Ilsa over to you. Yes, thank you, uh, Martin, for opening the floor. And thank you, Mariana, for taking the very difficult first presentation. Um, it's always difficult to speak in front of an audience we don't see. So my apologies beforehand if I start speaking too quickly. It's just because I get really enthusiastic. Um, so my name is Ilse Geisenhofer, and I work at Tour de Vila. And the work that you will see that I'll present now is mainly a collaboration between work we've done in Opera S, but also the Ecosystem Services Partnership and the GeoBond Group, uh, Biodiversity Observation Group of GEO. Um, oh, and then, yes. Um, so, um, just to give a bit of context, so Tour de Vila is a private research institute and we contribute to the conservation of Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean wetlands. And simultaneously, we are ourselves a manager of a nature reserve. Um, it's the domain of the Tour de Vila in the Camargue, which is uh, here. And you can see that for our work, we rely on a whole network of partners around the Mediterranean Sea, but also further out. And I think that this makes us quite an interesting collaborator and in, um, partner of our press, given that we really have this applied vision. Anything that we develop scientifically, we hope to use um, in an applied manner. So I think this is a really interesting um, uh, label um, partnership with our press. So why Mediterranean wetlands? Obviously, by profession, I have to say they're really important, but really, they are. Um, the Mediterranean region is uh, globally identified as a biodiversity hotspot. A lot of endemic species, and you can imagine that in an area which is uh, defined by such dryness, um, a lot of species uh, depend on either permanently or temporary availability of water. Um, so this is a very um, interesting uh, zone to work in, but it's also very challenging. For instance, if we look at what has happened to ecosystem services supply in this region, you can see that for most of the uh, services, the trends are ra rather negative um, in the last, let's say, 20, 25 years. And more importantly, very um, important service for human well-being, giving um, notably the provision of fresh water, but also the production of food are really going down. So these are uh, key indices that um, for the Mediterranean region as a whole, we need to find solutions for. And Mediterranean wetlands are very often either key suppliers of these services or, for instance, providing water to provide services and biodiversity elsewhere. So we were very interested in this study that we undertook uh, in Opera S. And what we wanted to know was if, for us, the long-term um, sustainable use of Mediterranean wetlands and their ecosystem services are so important, then surely it's of key importance that the complex social ecological interactions that we know exist are well captured in global sustainability targets. Now, from a research perspective, we know that ecosystem services require ecologically healthy and functioning ecosystems. We know that ecosystem services that are used are being co-produced and that human impacts are huge in the Mediterranean basin, but that we are lacking some sort of information, but also uh, means to convince 
other actors on long-term sustainable management and use of these Mediterranean wetlands. So we started working on um, a review with the co-authors you see here in the bottom of the screen. So this is a publication from our press that was published recently um, with the three main partners that I've just mentioned before. So just to give you a brief um, explanation of what the uh, methodology entails, entailed. So what we did was we looked at the Sustainable Development Goals and the Aichi targets and we identified which ecosystem services were actually related to which goal. And then we computed the frequency with which those specific ecosystem services were mentioned across these policies. And we did not want to overinterpret the inter uh, importance of ecosystem services, so we did not interpret general terms like sustainable development or essential ecosystem services. Just on a side note, the real term ecosystem services was only mentioned once in one goal of the sustainable development goal. So we're really talking here about how often water provision or uh, recreation was mentioned. So in order to know if we, the, the, the width of the complexity of these issues we covered, we then looked at five different variables of ecosystem service flows and whether information was demanded on each of these categories. So here we looked at potential supply, supply use, demand and interest. And then in order to verify whether we would have actual information available on these different parts for each ecosystem service, we looked at 10, ten ecosystem service assessments to see what kind of information they generally provide. So just diving straight into the results here, um, what you see here is there were um, in the middle you see the ecosystem services targets and then at the outer areas of this, let's say, star uh, diagram are the different targets. And the width of this list, uh, widths of these lines means that the ecosystem services are mentioned with a higher frequency in that particular goal. So what we can see is that there are in particular two goals that stand out in terms of their frequency of ecosystem services being mentioned. So the first one is SDG2 and the second one is the Aichi goal B. Now in case not everyone remembers exactly what each goal is, so the second uh, goal from the Sustainable Development Goals is about ending hunger and achieving food security. So it's a very logical link to provisioning services. And Aichi Goal B is more to do with um, reducing pressures on biodiversity and sustainable use. And here we see, I think, a very logical link to both provisioning services as well as regulating services. Now, if we looked at the individual ecosystem services mentioned in both targets, then we can look at the top 25 most cited ecosystem services. And these are given in the priority found, so, sorry, in the ranking found. So natural heritage and diversity was the most often uh, mentioned ecosystem service of importance across all these goals. Then we have about three targets related to water um, uh, services, then two services about food production, and we finish off with another cultural ecosystem service about cultural heritage. Now I find this very encouraging because the, this nice distribution about over the three categories of ecosystem services is not what we found generally when we do a review of, for instance, about scientific literature and assessments. We do not find this nice inclusion of all three categories, but usually um, uh, predominant uh, references of purification and regulating services and cultural services that are not that well represented. Is. And on top of it, water services relate, uh, related water services are often also well less studied than uh, terrestrial ecosystem services. So we found this very nice results. So the next question is, um, do we have what it takes in order to provide information on reporting on these ecosystem services? So if we look into the ecosystem service uh, in the Sustainable Development Goal 2, which is about ending hunger and achieving food security, then a good indicator could be uh, food production in tons per hectare. So if we want to achieve this goal, one could say, okay, we apply a management intervention that helps us to increase the efficiency of agricultural production. And it, the result would be that the tons of food per hectare increase. And we can see in the figure on the right that this is indeed the case based on World Bank data. But ecosystem services are not only based on production, but also on use. And therefore, the question is, did the production improve enough to feed everyone in the world? So um, 
then if we look at changes per capita in food, we can see that maybe in some parts of the world, indeed, food pro uh, per capita food production increased, but definitely not for the whole world. Uh, and in Africa, we are not sure that we're seeing an improvement. So before we can say anything about trends in these kinds of ecosystem services to obtain the sustainable development goals, we need a complexity of information. And for this, we um, developed a framework that identifies five different, let's say, variables of ecosystem service flow. And I'm just going to take you quickly from the top to the bottom because I don't want to spend too much time on the concept uh, behind it. Um, so the first one is interest. So it's basically what kind of governance measures are taken to stimulate, um, for instance, uh, the uptake of good soil practices. So this is, not, this is an indirect way of influencing ecosystem services flows. Then demand is really an explicitly expressed demand, which can be money or time. For instance, if we're talking about the soil that is eroded from agricultural lands, we can say that that is a reduction of the natural capital of a farmer. Then if we go on to use, so this is the actual uptake of the service, we could say that the amount of soil that is actually prevented from being eroded, that this is the actual service that is being delivered. The supply then includes management interventions. So for instance, farmers can choose to fix soil by building terraces. And finally, we have a potential supply which is very much linked to ecological structure and functioning. For instance, the capacity of vegetation to cover the soil and therefore prevent certain erosion from taking place. Um, if we then look at the indicators that are currently being used or demanded for the monitoring of the sustainable development goals, so these are the blue bars, we can see that more or less this is a nice distribution over the different variables. So it really strengthens our thoughts that the um, sustainable development goal policy is nicely multisectoral and interdisciplinary. If we look at the Aichi targets, which is by nature a more biodiversity-oriented uh, policy document, we can see that the red bars, the full red bars, we have quite a skewness, a bias towards the supply. Then if we look at the indicators that they use to report on the Aichi targets, so this is the indicators used in the global outlook, um, then we can see that uh, this bias remains, so we still miss quite a lot of indicators on use, demand and interest, but also that we lose quite a lot of information on potential supply, which is quite interesting because we would, at least I as biologists, would have expected that surely we have quite a lot of information on this now. So this is a quite interesting view on what kind of information is actually missing before we can really say anything about how ecosystem services uh, help to progress on the sustainable development targets. If we then look into the ecosystem assessments that we uh, reviewed, we found 277 indicators. And in this we found that most of the provisioning services actually are presented by supply indicators and regulating services are more presented by potential supply indicators. And in the whole, the cultural services and the demand and interest aspects are not very well covered. And just to show you that if we look into detail more into the individual services, we have exactly the same problem we also find in scientific literature, that cultural services are really underrepresented. So if we then go to the Mediterranean wetlands and what, how can, as an NGO of Tour de Vila, how can we use these results? So in 2012, the Tour de Vila actually developed its own outlook, a Mediterranean wetland outlook, and I scanned the indicators and I can see here that the Tour de Vila for provisioning services, we're not doing too bad there. We have several indicators on different aspects of ecosystem service flows. Um, however, we do have a little bit of a knowledge gap there on the interest side, so the impacts and measures of governance. And I would say that on a whole, we have uh, significantly less indicators than in the other assessments. So you have to realize that of all the different um, ecosystem services, we don't in the whole have a lot of indicators. So for us, this really stimulates our thinking about where should we develop either monitoring schemes or start collaborations to fill up these knowledge gaps. And at the same time, it strengthens us that we actually do have a better grasp um, about provisioning services, for instance, than um, could be internationally the case. So this is typically how we use this OPRES study to develop our own, let's say, strategic planning. Um, but it also made us reflect on what the entry points would be 
uh, for ecosystem service and international policies and then from us from an NGO perspective. So obviously one of the questions that we ask ourselves is how can we ensure that ecosystem services for Mediterranean wetlands are included in international policies or policy science platforms. So the Tour de Vla um, and Medwet, which is a um, uh, organization that serves different Mediterranean countries on information on Mediterranean wetlands, we do multiple things. So for instance, for sustainable development goals, the national countries should provide data. And obviously, for multiple reasons, not every country is able to do this and to the same extent. Um, so one of the things that we do is we help local observatories to develop monitoring schemes in a way that this data can be used at higher spatial scales and replies to some of the knowledge needs that are felt at national level. We also try to reduce important data caps. So we saw that, for instance, a lot of water-related ecosystem services are very important, but they're also typically services for which less data is available. Um, we also have spatial gaps. Mediterranean region, uh, in, in many of these um, uh, reports, are being cut up in a European part, an African part, and a Central Asian, Asian part. Um, and this is very difficult then to get information that makes sense at this biome uh, level where we're experiencing such heavy impacts from uh, climate change, for instance. So we use also this in order to gather all this information and develop information on, for instance, man management tactics to mitigate ch climate change impacts. We also face a lot of sensitive information, uh, sensor data, water quality, or water quantity, which might, for strategic reasons, not be shared between countries, but not even between actors. To name an example, I will not name the country, but we know that there are some really damaging reports on water quality, um, which real impacts on direct impacts on human health. But they're not, um, there is, um, they're not allowed to be published by the government because it's actually due to agricultural pollution, um, notably from greenhouses, and this creates money and jobs. So there is no open communication about this data or the monitoring of this water quality. And the same for water quantity, so the construction of dams is really a big issue in the Mediterranean. So it's not only about, um, for instance, the World Bank financing dam constructions and then not telling how much water you're actually going to keep behind, but also sometimes countries are linked by the same river, so depending on how much water you aim to let through, this impacts countries lower down. And this is typically topics in which you might get half-truth information or no information at all. So these are quite challenging issues for if you want to report on sustainable development goals. Just to uh, name one other, for instance, the IPBES, which is uh, currently uh, finalizing its regional um, assessments. So for these kinds of assessments, very typically, uh, mainly scientific publications are included. So what we try to do from the Tour de Vla is we try to validate and publish our results that we find as much as we can, um, because else it will not even get included in these big reports, which we hope are agenda setting globally. Um, but we try to do them at the Mediterranean Basin scale because then you include many more countries and many more examples and hopefully they're less easy to ignore. And one of the things that we struggle with, and I know that IPBIS struggles with this as well, but we have quite a lot of indigenous knowledge, no notably with our local observatories, but obviously not everyone has time to and do the monitoring and do the lobbying locally and publish on this so that it can actually be included. So we have quite a lot of local indigenous knowledge and it's it's quite difficult to see how we could get that included in these big uh, international frames. So what are next steps? So we're very happy with the work that we've been doing in OPRES. It's been a real pleasure and it's also stimulated us on thinking ahead. So. I think that from a, an NGO perspective, then improving a metric is a step forward and we think it's important. But really, if we could improve the use of our metrics, it would be a huge leap forward. Um, so this is uh, what, we'll, what we try to focus on now. So for instance, for the SDGs, we would really hope that we're in a process towards more binding promises on progress and targets, like for instance, in the climate change agreements, because if there is more binding promises, 
This stimulates an interest in funding sustainable management and development of natural research, sorry, resources. So for instance, for Mediterranean wetlands, this means that if people build a dam, then the drying up of the uh, wetlands which comes after the dam is a huge carbon emission. And this is very good that um, it finally becomes visible and also noticeable for governments. And also the inverse, that the capacity of Mediterranean wetlands to mitigate impacts of climate change are finally being recognized and there's actually investments in restoring wetlands. So for us this is really positive and very concrete linkages between international, maybe sometimes abstract policy targets and how they get implemented in the region. So for IPBES this is also still a question mark. So for instance, currently we're a lot of reports are being developed at international scale and you can see why it's so important so that all the countries really get engaged in this. But we're currently still lacking a bit this translation of these results into recommendation at national scale to help facilitate implementation. And this would be really helpful in order then to build uh, from uh, with the local actors. And additionally, I think that a lot of IPBES work was also about concepts and I think that it can go a bit farther still in terms of recommending measures and capacity building. Now, not in all countries we work in are necessarily governance, which, is the, um, which has the most impact. And I agree with some of the questions that were just posed. But local observatories and local people become increasingly active through social media and actually achieving things. So for us, it's not a only about recommending measures to governments, but it's really also about helping people underground. So that was the last slide of my presentation. So if anyone is interested in working on ecosystem service working group, there are many, um, just to name three. So the GeoBon one, the one of ESP and uh, our own Mediterranean one, you're very welcome to join us there. Um, and basically, thank you for listening. Ilsa, thank you very much for your presentation. Now, I would like to go to Kate Flood, and Kate, if you're still with us from the National University Galway in Ireland, we'll be coming to you in a minute. Um, you had a question submitted a bit earlier. Should consideration of ecosystem services become mandatory when doing EIAs, which I take to mean economic impact assessments? Um, I think this links nicely with what Ilse was just saying about how can we get more binding commitments. Uh, but Kate, would you like to say your piece? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, just the environmental impact assessments, I suppose, that ecologists work on um, and appropriate assessments. Um, I don't think they're included. Uh, they include ecosystem services at the moment in the UK. I was just wondering, you know, should be or is there any plans to do that. Okay, Elsa, any thoughts on economic, uh, sorry, environmental impact assessments? Would they help? Should ecosystem services be mandatory? Um, could these move towards being interpreted as more binding promises? Yeah, I guess it depends a bit. Okay, of course, yeah, the short question, uh, the short answer is yes. The question is only who makes it obligatory to do this by whom. So for instance, the World Bank has been really good in trying to mature its environmental impact assessments and it's really starting to shape up to be really biodiversity relevant. Um, so yes, if they could include an ecosystem service approach which also helps to link them to more local actors, then I think that that would definitely uh, be a great leap forward problem is the World Bank is not the only player in financing dams and the Chinese apparently are an increasing uh, financer of dams and their environmental impact assessments are let's say less restrictive so I don't know I mean if, if we're talking from a European perspective then yeah maybe yeah I think that any, in, if in any case you can include better linkages between social and ecological aspects then this can only go forward but I'm always a bit hesitant in saying who has to say who that it has to be included. I prefer that people and especially sectors, and they do increasingly see the benefit of sustainable development uh, and thinking about it sustainably rather than making things obligatory and having to set up a whole set of governance rules and yeah. 
top-down administrative um, uh, yeah, structures. Okay, Ilse, thank you very much. Um, I have a, another question here from Michael Peter, who I think unfortunately is no longer with us on the call. Um, you've been talking a lot about which ecosystem services are included in the SDGs and others, but which are omitted <laughs> and why do you think that's the case? Well, I think an interesting question, and this is one of the reasons why we started this study, is why aren't ecosystem services the term at all mentioned? There's only one mentioning of it. Um, that's, I think, already interesting. Um, yeah, are ecosystem services omitted? It's only, I mean, it's quite a difficult, daunting task, isn't it, to only come up with 17 targets and then sub-targets and trying to cover everything the best as you can. I'm not sure that any, I wouldn't say that any particular ecosystem service is missing. It might not be sufficiently explicitly mentioned and I think in particular then the translation into which indicators are demanded for reporting, that's where a lot of ecosystem services go missing. And I think that's more important because really a general text is not necessarily what's going to be done in reality but the indicators that's going to trigger a lot of countries in investing in particular things. Ilsa, thank you very much. We're almost coming to the end, but I'd like to try and squeeze in one more question if we can. Um, we had a question earlier from Miriam Grace who says, what are the particular challenges of ecosystems in the marine ecosystem services? And seeing as you're a specialist in the wetlands, and you can talk about that, <laughs> but what about the marine ecosystem services? What do you think is absolutely critical there? Well, I have to admit that I'm more of a dry feet person than a wet feet person. Um, but uh, what I know from my colleagues that work on marine ecosystem services is, first of all, methodology. I think that for a lot of the terrestrial part, we have made huge progress, notably in the mapping of ecosystem services. We're still not there yet, but it's really improved. And this is obviously much more difficult for marine systems. So in terms of data, collecting data and knowing what is where, this is very difficult. And um, if you also think about the whole ownership problem, so if you're a terrestrial person, then you say, okay, this is my land or this is a natural park. But on sea, it's very much more difficult to see who exactly uses which part for what. Um, and therefore, the, for instance, including actors in developing sustainable um, solutions uh, is much more tricky. So I think that um, the marine area, given also its importance um, for human well-being and climate change, um, really deserves a lot of more of attention uh, and method development in order to strengthen that sector. Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to both our speakers, to Marianne Ketunen and Ilse Gessendorfer for your presentations. We have to bring it to an end here, which we need to stop at uh, 1400 uh, Central European time. Thank you very much to all of our participants for listening in and for all of your questions. If you asked a question and we weren't able to deal with it in the webinar, it will be on the OPLA site and both our panelists have committed to answering those questions within, let's say, 48 hours. So do go back to the Opera site to see what those answers are. But from me in Brussels, from the Prospects team, and from everybody in Operas, thank you very much for joining us for this webinar. And do join us at the same time next week for our next in the Operas webinar series. Thank you very much, and goodbye.